Hello everyone and welcome to Manitoba Agriculture Crop Talk webinar. If you have any questions during the presentation today, you can type them into the Q&A located on the bottom toolbar of the Zoom screen and we will answer them at the end of the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and those registered for Crop Talk will receive a link to the recording. Thank you. Thanks, Erin. I'd like to welcome everybody to the October 18th edition of Crop Talk. And uh, today we uh, uh, have uh, Warren Ward on from the Canola Council of Canada. And Warren is going to give us a, an update of the Canola 4R Advantage program that uh, they're managing and running. And uh, I think there's a lot of good information there. And I think uh, it's uh, always uh, making few changes to it. So there'll be some updates and some new things that producers could be looking at. So Warren is going to go through that. And from there, we'll uh, go into the uh, crop scouting panel. There's been a few questions that have come through as well as maybe a little bit of an update from the field. And we'll, uh, we'll kind of go from there. But uh, with that, I'm going to get uh, Warren to uh, give us an update on the Canola 4R Advantage. So uh, Warren, if uh, you'd like to grab the screen and we're ready to go. Great, all right. Well. Thank you for that introduction. It's a pleasure to be here with you this morning. Uh, yeah, so I would like to, to take the opportunity here just to talk a little bit about our Canola 4R Advantage program and uh, maybe highlight some of the things that uh, that folks aren't aware of in, in terms of some of our changes from year one to year two and, and just do a, a general overview. So with that, I will take it away and hopefully uh, if there's questions or anything like that, we'll uh, we'll be able to address those at the end. So what is the uh, the Canola 4R Advantage program, I guess, is a pretty good place to start. So this is a, a program that's offered through the Canola Council of Canada. And uh, what it is, it uh, it's part of the On-Farm Climate Action Fund. So if you think of uh, of the off-calf is, is what we commonly refer to that as. That's the umbrella that this program falls under, and we're one of uh, one of a number of organizations that are offering funding to farmers through this uh, on farm climate action fund. The uh, the Canola for Our Advantage is a two year program offering farmers incentives to initiate or advance for our nutrient stewardship practices when growing canola, and we really wanted to. Uh, to, to highlight that 4R component. It's something that's been important to us that uh, we've been talking about and promoting for, for quite some time. And, uh, you know, it's it's interesting in some of the uh, more informal survey or polls that we've done at various meetings and things like uh, on things like Canola Watch over time. One of the things that we always hear is uh, when we ask about why people aren't using 4R management practices and quite often, uh, um, economics came up as as one of the reasons why so uh whether that be people weren't sure if they would see a, a you know an economic return to these practices or the cost of getting started with it was was something that was holding people back so uh when when the opportunity came about to participate in the on farm climate action fund to help promote for our uh, we thought here's a great opportunity to help people get to that. Uh, you know, if it's something you've been thinking about or you're not sure about, here this helps a little bit with the financial incentive in terms of implementing these practices. So that's important to keep in mind. We're initiating or advancing these for our practices um, because part of the goal also through through OFCAF is is the environmental component of uh, of uh, reducing nitrous oxide emissions. So we're looking at it. We wanted something that was going to um, make sense on the farm and have and have uh, good production uh, related results, but also have that that um, environmental benefit aspect as well. Uh, what's our goal for the for this program? And again, that was really to help growers uh, implement these these for our practices on canola acres and improve their their nitrogen fertilizer efficiency. Uh, so, so that is a, one important thing about our program is that it is uh, through the off-calf, there's a number of different uh, categories that these programs can fall under. Ours is specific to nitrogen management and it is specific to canola acres, whereas some of the other programs out there uh, could uh, include things like rotational grazing or cover cropping. Uh, those, those were all um, uh, aspects of, of the off-calf program as well, but ours is specific to canola and nitrogen management, so that's important to keep that in mind as well. 
And I'll just uh, take a look here. So we've got a number of BMPs that that are funded uh, or eligible for funding through this program. And we'll just take a quick look at them here. So the first one we have is soil testing. Now, soil testing uh, is uh, does include the cost of going out there and collecting the soil sample, as well as the um, the the costs associated with that lab analysis. So kind of a two two parter there to it. Uh, you know, a lot of a lot of farms aren't aren't doing their own soil testing, so they're getting an agronomist in to do that, and and there can be a, a cost associated with that. So we wanted to make sure that was um, was uh, uh, covered as well to help implement this practice. Uh, we do have a list of approved soil testing labs uh, on our on our website, and I'll show a link later on in the presentation to that website for anybody who would like to to go and have a little closer look at some of these BMPs or, or requirements. And with any of these practices, uh, I'll mention it each time, but uh, growers are eligible for up to 85% of costs associated with, with these uh, BMPs. So 85% of the cost of uh, an agronomist going out and collecting the soil sample, as well as 80, 85 percent of the cost of that lab analysis. Our next uh, practice would be field zone mapping. And uh, this is um, this BMP really is looking at covering or helping uh, with the costs associated with consulting uh, with a professional agronomist to develop these these nitrogen uh, management plans within a field. So to be eligible for this uh, must have a minimum of two zones with, within a field. And really what we're trying to do is tailor those nitrogen applications. So whether that's, uh, you know, in some cases, increasing the amount of nitrogen in some zones and decreasing it in others based on, on what you might be doing for a blanket application across that field. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of interest in this one. Uh, you know, if you look at the at from a four R standpoint, I would say this is a, a more advanced practice than something like soil testing, for instance. So there's uh, one of the things we were trying to do was put uh, have have some practices available for uh, for for people who are at different levels within that four uh, R management on their farm to begin with. Um. With this one, uh, it it is quite often when you're working with that uh, agronomic consultant that they are doing your soil sampling as well and maybe billing you uh, as a farm in terms of the bill might be uh, uh, soil sampling and and the cost of generating these maps might be rolled up into one. So that's that's fine for uh, for the program. Uh, you can still submit uh, the application like that, but we do just from a, a um, administrative standpoint, we would uh, want to see that you can put a, a fair market value on the soil sampling and the the zone map uh, creation uh, components just for uh, for tracking purposes. And it's uh, it's it's actually not too bad. I'll talk a little bit later on as well about the application process. And next up, we have our uh, enhanced efficiency fertilizer uh, BMP. And so, really, what we're looking at at with this is products designed to release nitrogen or make that nitrogen available over a longer period, so that the uh, we're we're hitting that timing of nutrient application closer to when uh, when plants are going to to need it and reduce nitrogen losses to uh, to the atmosphere leaching and whatnot. So um, with this, um, it's important to to note that uh, nitrification and urease inhibitors both must be used. So uh, we're looking at dual inhibitor products to be eligible for this practice. And that's coming through uh, through agriculture and agri-food Canada's program guidelines. So so that is one uh, one requirement that that is necessary for for this BMP. Um, there are other, uh, other, uh, products out there such as ESN, which is, uh, a polymer coated urea, and that is also eligible for, for this BMP. So we've got dual inhibitors and ESN are, are the products that, uh, that are covered here. Uh, if we think about, uh, the dual inhibitor products, uh, that could be an additive product that you add to your UAN or urea. And uh, it uh, could be, you know, so for instance, like a, an RMU Advance would be an example of that. Uh, it could also be a fertilizer that has those 
that dual inhibitor formulated right into the the fertilizer itself. So with that, we're thinking of of a product something like Super U would be an example there. Um, so again, that uh, the dual inhibitor is is important. We do have a list of eligible products on the website as well. So if you're not sure, you can always go check it out there. We did recently expand this um, this eligible. Uh, product list. So uh, if you haven't looked at it for a while, that's a fairly new change. So I encourage you to go have a look there. Um, there may be some some products that uh, you weren't expecting to see that are there now and, and might be eligible. So uh, definitely go and have a look at that if you're not familiar. So we have a number of, of changes to the program from year one to year two. And uh, anybody who is a uh, uh, a participant in year one uh, and and hasn't hasn't looked at the program. I think it'd be uh, a worthwhile uh, look. So we took into account some of the feedback we received and just ways we could uh, could make the program a little bit stronger. Uh, so the uh, you know it's always nice to talk about the the dollars first off. So we do have uh, an increase in how much funds you can receive for each BMP. Uh, so in year one of the program, we had that capped at six thousand dollars per BMP. In year two, we've upped that to $20,000 per BMP. So we really want to make sure that uh, for those who are interested and in, in, uh, um, that nobody gets uh, shortchanged or left out of, of being able to apply for the program. Uh, also, another change for year two is that we uh, you can apply for as many BMPs or all three BMPs if, if that's what you want. Whereas in year two, we had that capped at, at two BMPs per farm. Uh, so again, I uh, just want to make sure people are able to capitalize on on what uh, what BMPs make sense for them on their farm. Uh, one other thing, and we'll talk a little bit more about the 4R plan here in a moment, but um, th there is a, a, a reliance on working with 4R designated agronomists to, uh, to access the funds for this program. And uh, what we realized that that uh, does come at a cost as well. And one one change that we did here for year two was to um, to include consulting fees with the for our designated agronomist for generating that for our nutrient stewardship plan. So we do require that nutrient stewardship plan, and you you know it's a a bit of a process where the grower sits down with the with the designated agronomist and finds out what's going to be um, you know what the best plan is for their farm and. And uh, some, you know, different agronomists are going to have different, um, uh, you know, work situations. So some of the larger companies might be different than an independent agronomist who's kind of on their own. And we just wanted to make sure that uh, we were recognizing that that there is a um, uh, a cost of of working with those agronomists. And if if they are needing to cover their costs, then then growers do have the uh, the opportunity to to cover that under the program. Uh, and and lastly, just to um, to look at it, so I, I mentioned earlier that the 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 program is really for initiating or advancing for our nutrient stewardship practices. So looking at at putting new practices in place on the farm, and uh, so we're still continuing that. If you had a field that was eligible in year one, that field would still still be eligible in year two. So uh, any of the practices that were new starting with this program will be considered as new for year two of the program as well. So as I mentioned, there's a number of uh, organizations out there with programs, including including our Canola for Our Advantage program. And uh, the total cost that a farm can receive throughout the two years of funding is that $75,000. So if you're working with our program and another program or even two other programs, uh, you would uh, want to keep that that seventy five thousand um, dollar um, cap in mind, so that we're not uh, over uh, uh, or not expecting th uh, to get uh, uh, money that uh, that you're not eligible for. So a few uh, a few things here for uh, specific to year two of the program. Uh, so we do have. Um, uh, year two beginning on April 1st of 2023, so back in the spring. And because it uh, it it runs or it's tied to the uh, the federal fiscal year, so it's uh, the program year goes from April 1st to March 31st. So again, this year two of the program is covering any costs that were incurred starting on April 1st of, of 2023 and up until March 31st of, of next spring. 
uh, with year two of the program, we do have an application deadline of November 30th. So that's uh, coming fairly quickly here now. So again, we encourage uh, you to get those applications in as soon as possible to uh, to get the process underway. And not only the application, but uh, submitting the um, the the expenses and and getting uh, receiving your funds. You know, the sooner the sooner we you start that and and submit the relevant uh, information, the sooner that those funds can can be paid out. If it's uh, a um, if the practice has already been completed. Uh, again, our program is specific to canola, so one of the requirements is that the field you're applying for does have to be seeded to canola. And the, uh, the again, I touched on this, but uh, any new practice for the farm or the field going back to February 7th, when the program was first announced of 2022, is still considered an eligible, uh, eligible practice. Uh, again, you can combine funds from our program and other off-calf programs, but just keep in mind that $75,000 limit. And uh, again, that uh, there are specific requirements for each BNP. So if you do have, have any further questions, we do have a good Q&A, uh, uh, frequently asked question section on the website there, and uh, and as well, a lot, a lot of details that are really uh, could could make this short presentation into a half a day one. So uh, if you do have have questions, there's always an opportunity to find them online or or get a hold of us directly. Uh, so as I mentioned, the four R plan is a uh, is a vital component of our program. Um, so this is the process where the farm sits down with the designated agronomist and and uh, and comes up with a nutrient management plan for that farm specific to the fields that really uh, can can help drive your your fertilizer uh, um, efficiency on farm and, and and enhance your production so i've uh, you know if we're talking about eligible um, what are eligible practices and say you've done something like soil testing in the past but you never had a 4r plan in place by putting this 4r plan in place now that um, because we're in, we're advancing those for our practices that would make your your soil testing eligible for that field. Um, there are we do have a list of resources as well on the website for uh, through Fertilizer Canada that uh, that does help with that for our planning process for anybody who's who's not familiar with it and. Um, one change that we do have from year one to year two of the program is that uh, in year one, you could submit your application and you had a window to, to come back and, and say that you've completed that for our plan. For year two of the program, you can't submit that application until you have that for our plan in place. So uh, you we really do encourage people to have that, that planning discussion with their with their agronomist, get that to uh, get their plan in place and then submit their application for the canola for our advantage program. A few other uh, few other details here with the program. Uh, um, be, as I mentioned, uh, the the partnership between the farm and the for our designated agronomist is an important one. Uh, through the application process, either either party can initiate the application, uh, but both are required or have requirements to uh, to complete that that application in in order to for it to be completed. Um, and as as part of that process, there is attestations from both the grower and the agronomist to uh, um, ensure that I guess the uh, the program is is operating as as we've designed it to. Uh, some of the applications could be audited uh, through the CCC or Canola Council of Canada, and that's to ensure that uh, that uh, every everything is happening as uh, as it's as it's designed to. Um, and uh, your your data that you submit through the program is is secure. So really, what we're doing with that is uh, uh, obviously there will be some some sharing of data between the farm and the for our designated agronomist, just in terms of uh, being able to deliver the program. Uh, and again, Agriculture and Agri Food Canada would have access as well uh, as they need for what is necessary to administer uh, and and report on on the program. Uh, because it is a, a financial program, of course, the Canada Revenue Agency will also have uh, have some access there as well. 
Uh, it's important to note, though, that your information will never be uh, uh, publicly reported individually. Anything that does come out would be on an aggregate basis. So, you know, uh, if we want to say how many acres were soil sampled, for instance, it would not be tied to a specific application, but rather all uh, all applications within a region. So here's the uh, the QR code that can take you to the the website. Um, hopefully, if you uh, don't haven't been on the website, I encourage you to uh, to snap a picture or or check that out uh, now. And um, again, we've got a lot of a lot of information on there that uh, covers a lot of ground. But I've touched on I think the basics here this morning. Um, I do want to highlight though that that November 30th deadline is uh, is an important one in terms of getting those applications submitted so that uh, you can get the process started and and again uh, keep uh, keep things rolling along so I believe that's all I have here today so I thank you for your time and uh, if there's any questions I'm not sure Lionel did you want to uh, do that now or what was your uh, what was your plan we might as well uh, hit to the questions right now. We've had a few that have come in. So um, uh, first one, uh, does each individual field require a 4R plan? Meaning if a practice such as using Super U is being implement implemented on nine fields, for example, does a 4R agronomist need to complete a 4R plan for each of the nine fields? So... Uh, I think the short answer to that would be no. Uh, the 4R plan is kind of a, I would I would call it more of a, not a field-based plan. It's a farm-based plan, but it does take into account each field. So again, we want to treat each field uh, individually and, and, and ensure that we're, um, uh, you know, I, I want to, I, I think about uh, the right rate, for instance. It, the right rate may not be the same across all nine fields. Uh, you could have uh, have higher or lower rates across each field that that's going to optimize your production. So I think that would be part of what's involved in the plan. But it's it's one plan between the uh, between the farm and the agronomist. Okay, uh, I think you might have covered uh, this one. Um, different range of pricing uh, for soil sampling. Does it affect the 85% cover uh, coverage? So I guess what they're trying to ask is, is if my soil sampling costs more than the next guy's, does the 85% still work? And I think you might have answered that. Yes. Yeah. So um, I, again, uh, as long as it's uh, not an unreasonable amount, I guess, that that, that could be flagged as uh, this seems suspicious, but um uh, and then I, I should also mention when it comes to the soil sampling, the the lab analysis that is covered would be a basic uh, package um, because we're focusing on on nitrogen management uh, with this program. So uh, that was uh, was determined that we would just cover a, a, the cost of a basic um, analysis package. So uh, hopefully that that answers the question. Okay, and just a comment regarding the first question. Um, that is not the way that this was been communicated previously to my knowledge. So I guess they were probably under the impression that they needed to do one per field. Yeah, so the the plan itself is, is going to take into account each field and you're uh, uh, maybe if uh, if I think back to year our our application process in year one uh, was more on an individual field basis compared to year two, uh, that's uh, I'm I, you know that might be one if uh, if someone has a specific question there that uh, they could get a hold of us and we could we could talk about that. But I would I would say that for our plan itself, uh, it does take into account each field. So. Um, in a sense, you do have a plan for each field because you you may not be treating each field the same. But the plan itself is a is really taking into account the the uh, the entire farm. Okay. And and uh, sorry, just to maybe okay. clarify on that, each field would be included in that. So the the you you have to say that by by attesting that you have a four R plan in place for that field uh, doesn't mean that it's just for that field it could be that you've got a, a broader for our plan right but it does encompass that field as well 
Okay, because you need to keep track of each individual field because you're only allowed to apply for that field once, right? That's correct. Yeah. Or, or um, yeah, just from a tracking standpoint, uh, um, you know, if you are participating in more than one program too, there's a, a number of reasons why each field would need to be identified in terms of uh, for, for um, administration of the program. Right. So basically a legal description of each, each field, I guess is what's required, I guess. Right. Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, this question uh, may be a little bit difficult. Uh, uh, any programs for applying fertilizer at right rate or right time if producer does not have the equipment? So I guess they might be getting at is custom custom uh, rates covered in, or custom covered in any of these programs? Uh, with our program, that's not uh, that's not an eligible expense. Um, as same thing with the equipment upgrades. So uh, you know, if we think back to the the um, the zone the zone mapping VMP, for instance, we we don't cover things like equipment upgrades to be able to do that. Uh, that wasn't uh, within within the guidelines of what we're able to offer for, through this program. Okay, was there another program? I'm just trying to think myself if there was another program that helped producers with uh, upgrading equipment. I, you know, there has been in the past. I'm not not as familiar with that, but uh, I I want to say through even things like uh, the environmental farm plans and and whatnot. I, I believe there have been some in the past, but uh, but I'm not maybe the the best person to talk about those ones. Okay, no, that's great. Uh, that's uh, all the questions we have gotten in right now, Warren. Uh, are you going to be able to hang on in case something comes up uh, a little bit through the rest of the, the morning here? Sure thing. Yes, I, I can do that. Great. Thanks, Warren. And uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, uh, lots of uh, good information there. And uh, I think, uh, I think uh, like I think I mentioned when we were talking at the beginning there, that... Uh, I think uh, some producers are kind of well versed with the program, but I think there's some producers that are still learning about it. And it definitely ends in uh, November. Then the the that's the deadline. There's no extensions thinking about or. So that's our that's our application deadline. And again, that's um, covering expenses that could be uh, that that could occur up until March 31st. So uh, kind of a, maybe a bit of a forward looking process for. Uh, apply for some of the practices that you may be using next spring or uh, you know if it's fertilizer that you might be purchasing in the spring uh, apply now but uh, um, that uh, that's our, our window I guess that we that we operate within uh, in terms of program extension there's really nothing uh, nothing out there at this point in time okay and uh, I just got a comment in here uh, regarding the equipment upgrades that we were talking about and uh, available through the uh, watershed program. So uh, that's uh, good information. Thanks for, thanks for that. Okay, so uh, let's uh, jump into the crop scouting panel. And um, like I mentioned at the start, we had a few questions come in uh, during the week here. And uh, the first one I'm gonna shoot out to Dennis Lang here. Um, I uh, got some guys that have been uh, we, seeing the weather conditions the way they are and seeing uh, a lot of stuff not wanting to dry down right now. Uh, some producers were wondering what is the safe and best storage moisture for soybeans. So I uh, got a hold of Dennis yesterday and asked if he'd be able to maybe address this one uh, for the uh, panel today. So uh, Dennis, uh, take it away. Okay. I want to see if you can hear me, Lionel. Am I coming through okay? You're coming through perfect. Perfect. Good. I'm sitting in my truck in Winnipeg right now. So with my computer on my lap. So, um, okay. So there's a few things you have to be aware of. Like we've gone through this before in different years. Uh, 2019 was a, a year where a lot of the soybeans actually came off in, in um, tougher conditions. They came off 16, 17% moisture. So it's not a new thing. It doesn't happen very often, but it does happen. Um, the first thing you need to be aware of is if, if you're looking at storing grain at, at uh, soybeans at higher moisture levels, um, into aeration is probably your best bet to start with because you want to cool those beans down. That's the important part. 
when you look at this um, this temperature uh, chart here, I pull this off of the Manitoba Pulse Grower website, and you can see here that when you're looking at, let's say something at four degrees, um, I'm gonna get my, see if I can get my pointer happening here. And it's not going, but anyways. Um, uh, if you're looking at four degrees, storing at uh, 17 degrees, um, uh, or 17% moisture content, you're looking at about 90, uh, 90 days of storage. But there's a few things to kind of keep in mind with that. You know, I think where this question originally originated from is that a lot of the hopper bins are probably used that have aeration in it right now. So they're wanting to put it into storage without air. Um, I would say, still say that it's okay based on the time of year it is. Um, the grain temperatures are cooling now. We're probably in that 10, 10 degree range right now for any 10 to 14 degrees, I guess, for stuff coming off the field right now. So a few things to kind of keep in mind. So if you're looking at storing grain, um, cooling, very important. Uh, if you can't cool it, then make sure that what you're putting into that bin is relatively clean and clean, uh, and clean meaning not a lot of pods or a broken piece or sticks, uh, broken pieces of, of plant material. Um, you don't want to cause any any uh, opportunity for mold to happen as well. Uh, when you do put it into a bin, I would say put it into a smaller size bin. Like don't put it into a you know a, a ten thousand bushel bin if you if you can. Um, uh, try to put it into smaller bins that have maybe that uh, you might be able to move later on. I think that's the next important step as well that I like to do um, and tell growers as well. If you're putting beans in at seventeen percent moisture or sixteen percent moisture. Within 30 days, uh, you want to pull a, a load out of that bin and circulate it through. That, uh, in my experience, has uh, in, in the private industry has uh, told me that uh, it does help um, condition those beans if you can pull that load through. So if you're looking at right now 10 degrees um, or uh, 10 degrees Celsius for green temperature, uh, and you're looking at 17% moisture, you got about 50 days worth of storage in that respect here. Um, one of the other things I think we kind of alluded to talked about this earlier uh, when we were just kind of having a little side meeting with canola. Uh, if there's opportunities to move some of that higher moisture grain um, into the elevator system because it maybe you know they're looking for some drier uh, or they have some drier beans and they want to you know use that, you might want to shoot that option out to the uh, buyer as well to say that you have some you, you have some loads that you like to move. Um, probably the best thing you have done though so far is if you put the beans in, if you took them off at higher moisture and they're in the bin, that's a bonus to you. Because I think with uh, once we start getting into October, uh, we're into a bit of a wetter spell here today. And sometimes you need a few drying days you might not get. So if they're in the bin, that's good. But really, you need to just monitor that uh, that temperature and also monitor the, uh, the bin to make sure there's no crusting on, on top. So those are kind of some of the things that I like to do uh, uh, with uh, with that. But really... If you, if you can put them into an air bin and run those fans just to run the moisture, uh, bring the moisture down a little bit, um, you're not going to dry them, but you'll keep them in good condition. And if you keep an airflow through it, uh, that, those beans will keep for, for quite a while. So that's okay. what I have. And one other question, Dennis. Uh, in peas, soil tag is an issue. Soybeans, uh, wetter conditions, uh, wetter dirt, is that an issue in soybeans? Well, I think the bigger challenge in soybeans when you're trying to flex beans off and the ground is wet is you're you're going to end up with, um, you might have to cut a little bit higher uh, than you would normally like because what ends up happening if the ground is a little bit, we'll say tacky, um, it the flex header doesn't flow nicely on the ground. And so what ends up happening is you end up pushing dirt and soil and what have you um, into a commercial, um, uh, like a commercial or herbicide tolerant crush bean um, there, a little bit of earth tag is not the end of the world. Um, there are, you know, certain allowances for damage. So if you're over, if you're over 3% damage, you could get downgraded, but generally the bigger challenge with trying to harvest at this time of the year is not necessarily picking up dirt is being able to get all the beans that you can. And that's why, you know, sometimes with no sunshine, the soil just stays damp enough that it just doesn't, uh, that flex header doesn't skid nicely on the ground. And you end up losing more beans that way, but the sample is still relatively clean. Um, but also just keep in mind as well, if your plants are immature and you have, have pods in there, green pods, you, you will also need to adjust your, your, um, your top sieve to try to throw some of those, kick some of those pods out 
Um, if there's a few too many in there, you can close your top sieve off a little bit and throw some of those out if those seeds are still on the greenish side because you really don't need those in, in the sample. So it was just a couple of tips. Okay, and with uh, the wetter condition, is it going to be harder to thrash them out or is uh, do you need to adjust cylinder speed or cylinder width? Um, you know, really, it, 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 it'll depend on the machine and conditions, but if the straw... The pods will open up pretty good if the straw is is dry enough. Um, they don't they don't thrash terribly hard. Uh, you can increase your cylinder speed. Um, you know when I've done mine, I've 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 increased my cylinder speed sometimes to you know eight hundred RPMs on my rotary, and just to kind of be a little bit more aggressive a, a little bit. So again, keep in mind that would be for a crush bean. Um, if you're looking at a um, a conventional or a food grade bean. There are some other parameters such as earth tags, such as splits that you really need to talk to your buyer about. Um, but hopefully, you know, you're only having to uh, to deal with this. Back in 2019, when the bean moisture was 17 percent, the plants were were uh, the plants were mature. Uh, we were thrashing in November. Uh, they were actually the sample looked really nice. Uh, there wasn't really too much of an issue with with green material in there. It's just that the moisture was high and it. You know, and, and when you're talking November 11th, you want to get them off already. So. I think for the most part, just pay attention to what the sample looks like. Make sure if it's, if you are taking it off at higher moisture uh, that there's not a lot of pods in there because that's where the spoilage is going to occur at, at the top of the pile if that pile gets sealed off. Um, if you can go into that, if you do end up with a few pods, if there's a way to go in there and remove those pods from the top or at least push them to the side so that you know you, you don't get that pile sealing off because the moisture tends to move on its own a little bit. But uh, air bin does is, is definitely an option. And worst case scenario, you know, put them into a bin for now, and then you know, move them in the, into another air bin a little bit later on. But uh, um, you know, I I don't like to get into drying beans because that's another discussion point. And you can't dry some of these beans at high temperatures because you'll split them. And yeah, there's too many things to to really talk about there. So. Okay. Well, great. Uh, thanks, Dennis. And uh, Thank the point about. Uh, uh, kind of other stuff coming in the bin besides the, the seed. I know uh, some of the guys with flax are having the same problem. Um, and if you start getting a lot of weed seeds in there and you start getting some, even some stems, uh, the uh, it just increases the, uh, the ability for that, the heat. So uh, definitely a good point there. So thanks. Yep. And definitely, if you can get it into an air bin, that's probably the best thing. Because even even these days, if we're getting to 10 or 14 degrees, if it's in a bin, you put air on it and, and force a lot, some air through it, you will get a little bit of drying it. Because uh, if you're only bringing it down uh, you know, a little bit, not like you're taking it off at 20%, you're probably taking it off at maybe 15 or 16. So, Good point. Yeah, good. Thanks, yeah. Dennis. Thanks. Tim, I uh, had a producer uh, send me in uh, a couple of weeds uh, here, and uh, I thought it would be good to uh, bring them up and get you to help us identify them and talk a little bit about each of them. So, Kim, if you could take it away. Sorry. Yep. Yeah, thanks, Lionel. Uh, the, the picture there on the uh, left-hand side of the screen is either, I'm sure it's either a cow cockle or a night flyer and catch fly. Um, both of those are in the pink family or the Carolophilaceae family. They are characterized by opposite leaves and kind of a big knobby node at the stem where those leaves join on the stem. So you'll have two leaves. Um, they'll be... Um, they'll be up right across from each other. And then the next set of leaves is across from each other, but going the opposite direction. Um, so... and. So this one is actually quite easy to see that and it's really pretty hairy looking and very coarsely veined. So I would think night flyer and catch fly, that's the most common, but we do have pockets of white cockle as well. And it's very similar, um, very hard to tell apart until you actually see the um, the flowers on it and, and the, seed, the seed heads on it, the, the, the balloon shaped um, uh, calyxes are a little bit different on white flyer on, on white um, white cockle versus night flyer and catch fly. This one is hard to tell too sometimes because it grows really really low to the ground. Then it can look like a rosette. It's actually not. It just has really really short internodes, which is the stem, um, the piece on the stem in between the sets of leaves. So if you have a, something um, growing on the ground, you're not sure what it is. You actually can 
pull it up and turn it upside down. And then what I do is I start peeling the leaves off um, from the top, which I guess is technically the bottom of the plant, but now it's the top because you've turned it upside down. Once you strip away a few leaves, you can start to see that opposite leaf pattern. Um, and like I said, they, it looks like a rosette, but it's really not. Rosettes, a true rosette, will all the leaves will come from one growing point. And something like a nightfly and catch fly or a white cockle, um, especially in the fall, can really look very compacted and look like a rosette, but it's not. It just has really, really short internodes on the stem. And then the one on the right hand side, um, there's a couple of possibilities here. It could be a biennial wormwood. Um, it doesn't look like it has a lot of hairs on it. So I'm actually maybe thinking that might be it, but it's hard to tell from the picture. I'd maybe want to see a few more pics or of course, if I can see it in person, then I know biennial wormwood has a, a very distinct um, odor and biennial wormwood is not hairy at all. It's usually a darker green. It usually acts as an annual, um, despite the name, but it can act like a biennial. And so that, you know, a fairly big plant in the fall um, could be a biennial, by, um, and that would be something that would be ready to bolt next spring. Um, other possibilities could be Canada fleabane um, or uh, a false ragweed. Now, false ragweed and Canada fleabane look very much alike, but false ragweed um, has really rounded tips at the ends of the leaves and on the little pointy bits on the leaves um, versus um, versus Canada fleabane is very, very sharp and pointy. And another thing between Canada fleabane and by an, and um, and uh, uh, rag common ragweed uh, is that um, they're both hairy, uh, but the hairs are different and different looking and different feeling on them. And so our our wormwoods, when they do have hairs, they tend to be very soft and, and fuzzy and very fine, fine, soft hairs on them. Whereas something like um, a Canada flea bane does have hairs, um, but they're kind of uh, more sparse, definitely more sparse than on a wormwood. And they're definitely, and they're they're more pokey feeling. They're a little sharper feeling on the, on the hands. So I don't know, just looking at this, I don't know that it has super sharp um, pointy tips on it. It maybe does. I, I think it's either a Canada flea bane. Um, it's either Canada flea bane or a bite in a wormwood, but I'd have to have an, a better look or, or a few more picks. And I could probably tell the difference on that. Thanks, great. Yeah, um, and uh, yeah, I think I do might have a couple more picks and maybe I'll send them to you. But uh, yeah, it's uh, good that uh, guys keep sending them in. I think it's good just in helping us identify. So uh, great, great pictures to be brought sent in. Uh, okay, here's a question for the whole panel. As uh, I've been talking to some producers in the last couple of days and they've been telling me about a shortage of NH3, is anyone hearing you that in their areas? Anybody? Okay, well, this is something that I've uh, heard from some of the producers in my area. Uh, some guys have been saying they've been limited to a tank per day and uh, just uh, was wondering if we were hearing some of the same thing out there. So, uh, and uh, another question that has just come in and Marla, are you there? Okay, Marla maybe uh, isn't on today, but anyways, um, uh, I had a producer ask about, he's uh, broadcasting uh, uh, Super U and uh, he was uh, wanting to know if he should harrow it. And uh, I guess my recommendation would be uh, uh, the more soil contact, the better, but uh, I don't think it's uh, something you need to do. But uh, if you had the time and you're able to do it, I would probably go ahead and do it. Okay, a little bit about uh, harvest and where we're sitting right now. Uh, uh, we're getting close to being done. Uh, we've uh, getting into the 90% uh, completed in the province, which is uh, which is great. Um, I think the crops that uh, are left are the ones that are giving us a little bit of problems. And we talked a little bit about that with the uh, soybeans. I think we're seeing the same type of issues with canola. Uh, the stuff left right now is uh, still, uh, you know, pretty high moisture to be putting in a bin. And I think a lot of producers that are actually getting at it are are ones that have drier space or air space left. Um, and the other crop is flax. Uh, the the straw is definitely staying green, and we haven't really got a killing frost to bring any of those crops. Uh, those crops in. So I think uh, some of that is still going to be uh, sitting for a bit here. Um, 
a little bit of the corn is coming off, uh, varies throughout the province. And uh, still, again, with corn, and uh, we're still seeing some high moistures. And I think guys just waiting for for uh, those to uh, to dry down. So, uh, again, good to see. Good to see that uh, we're getting the crop off. And like I uh, mentioned, uh, probably by next week, uh, we'll be down to uh, corn and sunflowers and maybe a dioid acre of flax. But uh, I think by then, the, the rest of the crop will be completed. So... Um, uh, a few more slides to finish off for today. Uh, CAP is having some district meetings, uh, November 14th to December 5th, uh, various areas in the province. So if you're interested in attending uh, one of the CAP meetings, uh, uh, take a, go to their website and you'll find out uh, where, uh, where the meetings are being held. Registration is uh, now open for uh, the agronomist conference, uh, December 13th to the 14th. So uh, if you're interested in uh, going to the agronomist conference, I think it's uh, something that's a great learning experience every year. And this year, advanced technologies is uh, kind of one of the, the keys for the, the uh, conference. So uh, again, registration is uh, now open. So if you're interested in registering, uh, go to their website and, uh, and register. There is uh, early bird registrations uh, on right now. And also Crop Connect, uh, February 14th to the 15th. And I th think registrations are open for it as well now. Crop residue burning, uh, we're not seeing a whole bunch of it being done right now, but I think uh, uh, as guys get more and more uh, field, fall field, field work done, we're going to maybe see a little bit more. So just remember that if you're thinking of burning, make sure that it's a burning day and make sure you're in an area that doesn't require a permit. Uh, I still see the odd burn ban, uh, burning ban signs up from different municipalities. So make sure you're in a municipality that doesn't have a burning ban. And uh, and also the Manitoba hay listing. Uh, if you're uh, interested in selling some hay, uh, they'll call one of the two numbers here. Uh, the people answering the phone will definitely help you in getting your, your listing on. Just had a question come in here. Uh, the links you bet will be, uh, they'll, they'll be coming out uh, uh, the links for uh, all these are going to be going out on the uh, recorded uh, webinar. So yes, you'll be getting all these links. For the agronomist conference, if you go to their website uh, and same for, uh, for CAP, if you go to their website, it'll be there as to when their meetings are. Uh, the environmental farm plan is online still. Uh, I haven't put this one up for a while. I think if you're interested in doing programs for next year, I think yeah, you first of all need your environmental farm plan. So if you need it updated, definitely take a look there. Our extension specialist uh, for the province. Uh, if you've got questions about anything that you heard up today, or if you've got questions about what's going on in your field, definitely give any one of these people a call. They can give you a hand. Our livestock people uh, getting busy with doing uh, uh, ration balancing for producers. Uh, they're going to be uh, at uh, Livestock Expo, which is coming up probably next week. I'm assuming they'll probably be, uh, Moo Mania will be there. So be able to, to talk to some of these people there. So definitely uh, take in Livestock Expo. Uh, I think it starts the end of next week, I think. And MASC, there's our service centers, uh, there's their contact numbers. So if you've got questions, we're going to be getting down to harvest production reports. So definitely keep on top of that. Again, if you're measuring bins, uh, just want to keep this in front of you as to some calculations to help you figure out what's in your bins. And then there's the one for the peak or if you've got a cone in the bottom of your bin, same calculation. And contact information for myself and Lori. So um, if you have any questions, please give us a call or let us let us know and keep sending in all your questions and your pictures. They're great for us to deal with. And join us next week, October the 25th, for our next edition of, uh, of Crop Talk. Thanks for attending.